Hello, and welcome to Mission San Luis, a 17th century Spanish mission to the Apalachee Indians. I'm Jerry Lee. I'm an archaeologist with uh, Florida's Bureau of Archaeological Research, stationed here at the mission. Today I'd like to share with you some of the things we've learned from our excavations in the Spanish village at the mission. Now, as you may know, San Luis de Talimali occupied this spot, which was its second location, for just under 50 years, from about 1656 to 1704. San Luis was not a typical Spanish mission. It was either the largest mission or among the largest for the entire time it was here. San Luis was the administrative, religious, and military headquarters of Apalachee Province, the region between the Osceola and Ocloconee rivers, and the traditional homeland of the Appalachians. Even during its early years in this location, there were many more Spaniards here than would usually be present in other Spanish Appalachian missions. There was a Franciscan friar in residence, as would be true of all the formal missions. But here at San Luis, the deputy governor and his family also lived here, and there was a small garrison of soldiers stationed at the mission, about a dozen during the late 1650s. San Luis became the provincial capital. St. Augustine looked to the fertile land of Appalachie province as a food resource for the undersupplied town on the Atlantic coast, and as a source of labor too, especially as the Indians of the mission provinces around St. Augustine declined in numbers. Now in about 1675, the governor of La Florida in St. Augustine offered land grants out in the missionized provinces. Some Spaniards took advantage of the grants to found farms and ranches in Appalachie province. They were looking to improve their own lives, and if they could be far from the authorities in St. Augustine, all the better. There were at least nine Spanish-owned ranches in Appalachie province that paid taxes on their herds at the end of the 17th century. The new Spaniards in and around San Luis made additional labor demands on the Appalachies and monopolized some of the trade in agricultural and livestock products. They would eventually be one of the factors in the decision by some Appalachians to separate from the Spaniards at the beginning of the 18th century. One of the most important factors in the development of San Luis and Appalachian province in general was the port of San Marcos at today's St. Mark's, about 20 miles south of San Luis. This port had been in use since the late 1630s and offered the capability of transporting goods by water. While a lot of the food for St. Augustine was carried on the backs of the Appalachians and all of the labor gangs traveled to St. Augustine on foot, the port gave the Spaniards the ability to move some goods by ship. Cuba was closer by water than was St. Augustine, and Havana was the place where Spanish flotillas gathered whether they were coming from the old world or leaving the new. Havana offered better prices for agricultural surpluses and was where Spaniards could purchase items from all over the world. The relative material wealth that we see at San Luis is directly related to the port at St. Mark's. Some Spanish residents of San Luis were directly involved in shipping enterprises. It was more than just the resources of Appalachian province that sailed out of the port. The Spanish also had considerable contact with Apalachicola, a territory to the north of Appalachian. Deerskins and other goods from beyond Appalachian went through the port, and initially at least, Spaniards could avoid paying taxes on those exports. Soldiers accused Franciscan friars of profiting from the trade through St. Mark's while the friars accused the deputy governor and his soldiers of the same thing. While some of the Spanish colonists lived on their outlying ranches, there is no doubt that other Spaniards moved into the mission proper. We don't know exactly how many Spaniards lived at San Luis, but it must have been quite a few. There is a census from 1675 
that tells us that San Luis served 1,400 Apalaches, but there isn't a comparable accounting of the Spaniards. We know that the military garrison increased in numbers over the years, up to about 45 near the end of the 17th century. In 1702, when the Carolinians put St. Augustine under siege, almost 90 arms-bearing Spaniards were recruited from throughout the province to join the fight there, and additional Spanish soldiers would have remained at San Luis for the protection of the town. In 1704, when the Spaniards were preparing to abandon the whole province, the Spanish captain at San Luis spoke of the many demands placed on him by the Spanish families residing there. He said he'd already allowed some Spanish women and children to sail out of St. Mark's. One soldier who had been stationed at San Luis mentioned during an early 18th century legal proceeding that by the 1690s, San Luis had the appearance of a Spanish city. Now, the only map of San Luis we've discovered thus far actually dates from 1705, after the province had been abandoned. It shows the mission church and a number of apparently Spanish homes arranged neatly in a grid pattern. Now, of course, those houses had already been destroyed, so the map shows an idealized image of the town rather than an accurate depiction of where houses had been. During the early archaeological testing of the site, an auger survey was conducted. The archaeologists punched little holes in the ground every 10 meters across the site and recorded the types of artifacts found in each auger test. They noted that imported Spanish pottery occurred in higher numbers on the east and northeast of what would later be determined to be the Mission Plaza. The idea that the residences of the Spaniards were clustered in this part of the site was formed very early on, and subsequent fieldwork has confirmed that idea as essentially correct. Our excavations have revealed several structures that we believe were Spanish residences. They are all rectangular or nearly square in plan. We have found a couple of homes right on the plaza's edge and other homes a short distance away from the plaza. Just as the most important public structures were placed at the plaza's edge, it looks like the private residences of the most important people associated with the mission, like the chief of the Appalachians and the Spanish provincial deputy governor, were also on the plaza's edge. Nearly all of the Spanish houses are oriented northwest to southeast on their long axes. One other Spanish home is perpendicular to that orientation. We believe that the Camino Real, the, the main road into San Luis that extended east to St. Augustine, ran at a similar orientation, and the buildings of the religious complex also extend from northwest to southeast. We have located one structure in the Spanish village that has a different orientation from northeast to southwest. We know that it's an early construction because it's intruded on by a later Spanish home. This small earlier house, constructed with boards and wall trenches, might have been a modest home for a lower class Spaniard, perhaps a soldier. Nearly all of the larger Spanish residences contain artifacts within them or in their trash deposits that date to after about 1680. So it may be that the northwest to southeast orientation for homes was generally followed during the last few decades of the mission. Now it's worth mentioning that we have recognized the signature of mission period Appalachian construction cob-filled smudge pits and associated post molds among some of the Spanish constructions, including within the Spanish village. At the end of the 17th century, the Appalachian chief complained that the Spaniards were taking over his village. It seems we have clear archaeological evidence of this transformation at San Luis. 
Every one of the Spanish homes used the orange clay beneath our feet for their construction in one way or another. Most Spanish houses were constructed with wattle and daub technology, clay plastered over a wooden framework. One later home was built with wooden planks, but it also had a prepared clay floor. That clay was mined from large pits near the houses, and often we found that the pits were secondarily used for trash disposal. The pits don't seem to have been left open for long. They were filled relatively quickly with trash from the homes and probably from other places too. The objective was to fill in the big pits so you didn't have large open holes next to your home. Most of the excavations in the Spanish village were on a pretty large scale, exposing broad areas. This has allowed us to see a pattern that was repeated at most of the Spanish homes. First, there was the house itself. Then there was usually a nearby clay mine and sometimes more than one. And lastly, there were wall trench constructions nearby representing outbuildings or fence lines. All of the later Spanish houses, whether of wattle and daub or plank construction, were ground fast, post in ground structures. One house plan that has been repeated at least twice shows a simple two room plan. The first of these was excavated in the late 1980s in an area that had been a plowed field in the recent past. This wattle and daub structure was the example that intruded on the corner of that earlier wall trench structure. It was located about 80 meters east of the central plaza. The home measured six by nine meters and had a couple of post malls on its center line that suggested that it was separated into two rooms. There were two clay mines associated with this house and several additional wall trench features between the two clay sources. We cross mended one distinctive Indian potsherd from the Waddle and Daub house to another from one of the clay mines and found further ceramic mins between the two clay mines. So we can be certain of the connections between some of the trash discarded by the occupants of the Waddle and Daub house and some of the trash used to fill up the clay mines. The best preserved two room house was revealed at the east edge of the plaza. Since it was right on the plaza, the family that lived here was probably among the Spanish upper class. This was a plank or board home that had a prepared clay floor. It was about the same size as the Waddle and Daub home, but was marginally longer, about six by 10 meters. Because this area had never been plowed, we were able to see and map the charcoal flecked linear area on either side of its central support post, representing a partition that separated the house into two rooms. The central support post was deeper than any of the others and probably braced a gabled roof. A doorpost representing the entryway was preserved in the south wall of the structure. There was a pit near the residence where the clay for the floor was mined. To the south of the house was a wall trench representing a fence or maybe an outbuilding. Up to the north, a little two meter square outbuilding was recognized near other Spanish architectural elements. We'll look at this home in more detail. By a quirk of good fortune, one of the lines of the grid system utilized at San Luis separated the two rooms of the house, not perfectly, but pretty closely. We can look at artifacts recovered from west of and east of the 470 East line and be assured that we're looking at what went on in the two rooms of the home just before it was burned and abandoned. When we do this, it's clear that there were more artifacts in the eastern room of the house than in the western room, but those artifacts in the eastern room weighed less than those in the western. 
If we take the pottery from the house floor as a whole, we see that there were 323 more potsherds in the eastern half of the home, but they weighed about 425 grams less than the fewer potsherds in the western half. Little flakes of chert follow the same pattern, with many more in the eastern half of the home that weighed much less than the fewer chert flakes in the western room of the house. Finally, faunal remains in this instance, just little unidentifiable fragments of animal bone, were much more common in the eastern half than in the western. Taken together, it's clear that there was more activity in the eastern half of this home than in its western. All those artifacts in the eastern room were being crushed underfoot and incorporated into the clay floor by that increased activity. Another high-status Spanish residence was located near the northeastern edge of the plaza. This home was of wattle and daub construction and was nearly square, measuring seven by seven and a half meters. Its slightly longer axis was oriented perpendicular to the presumed trace of the royal road and to the structures in the religious complex. Between the daub household and the plaza, was a 10 meter square wall trench construction. Now that wall trench may delineate a courtyard for the Dobb house, but I think it's also possible that it represents an earlier home. Of course, both scenarios might be true. The skeleton of an earlier home could have been incorporated into the compound of a later household. There were three clay mines recognized for this house, and we mended pottery from the Daub house to other fragments from one of the clay mines and mended further pottery between two of the trash-filled mines. Once again, there were direct connections between some of the trash from the Daub house and some of the trash from the clay mines. Besides the 10 meter square wall trench, there were other wall trenches east of the house. Another to its north really looks like it may have been a fence line associated with the Daub household. A narrow wall trench outbuilding looks as if it was appended to the north wall of the Daub house, but since one of the clay mines cuts through it, it must have been there before the Daub house was built. Based on its location, and particularly on the artifacts recovered from this home and its trash deposits, this household may have belonged to the Spanish provincial deputy governor and his family. Well, what did we learn about the Spaniards from the artifacts in their houses and in the trash-filled pits? Well, let's start with their diet. The soils of San Luis are acidic and animal bone usually doesn't survive very well. Detailed faunal analyses have been conducted for a few of the big trash pits since bone is often a little better preserved in those contexts. The most striking finding is the quantity of domesticated animals in the diet. There were a lot of cattle and pig bones in the pits, along with a very few chicken bones. It appears beef was one of the primary sources of meat in the Spanish diet. Now this is probably a result of those cattle ranches around San Luis. Some of the exports through San Marcos were cow hides and tallow, so it looks like a lot of cattle were slaughtered for their skins and fat. There was an abundance of beef. This finding stands in contrast to many other Spanish colonial sites where, where the greater part of the meat diet came from wild game and fish. Now, some of the bones, both cattle and pigs, were from young animals. Now, certainly the most likely explanation for this is that there were so many animals that the Spaniards didn't mind taking younger ones out of the herd. There could be another possibility. The bones from young cattle could be a hint about the dairy industry that was just beginning to flourish in Appalachian province toward the end of the mission period. Now, I don't pretend to know much about these, this dairy industry, but I understand that male calves were sometimes 
culled since they wouldn't be milk producers. One historic document related that the wife of the deputy governor at San Luis expected a pitcher of milk to be delivered to her every day. Another document tells us that in preparation for a journey to the West in the 1690s, the Spanish expedition members purchased three calves to eat at San Luis while getting ready to leave, along with two tons of salted beef and a quantity of cheeses that had been locally produced at one of the nearby ranches for consumption during their travels. Now, if cattle and pig bones were common in the trash-filled pits, not many chicken bones were identified, even though chickens must have been the most numerous of all the domesticated animals. I think the fragile chicken bones just didn't survive the acidic soil conditions. One trash pit held eggshell fragments that we think were chicken eggs preserved in a lens of ashy soil. If we don't see many chicken bones, we do see evidence of their widespread use at San Luis. We find polished gizzard stones or gastroliths in various contexts around the site. Little stone or glass fragments swallowed by chickens to grind food in their gizzards and becoming smoothed and polished in, during the process. The gastroliths are evidence of chickens in the diet, even without the chicken bones. Some of the larger trash pits contain literally thousands of them. Over 1,300 of the gastroliths were held in the same pit feature where the eggshell fragments were located, and another big trash pit had nearly 3,000 of them. Two of the small wall trench features near the Spanish houses, the two meter square structure near the home on the plaza's east edge, and the wall trench structure that was cut by the big clay mine just north of the home on the northeast plaza edge, both held concentrations of the gastroliths, and I think both saw service as chicken coops. If beef, pork, and chicken made up the bulk of the Spaniards' meat diets, two of the trash pits indicate that fish and wild game were consumed as well. Both freshwater and brackish water fish bones were identified, along with deer and even some turtle. That same ashy lens in one pit that held the eggshell, probably where the contents of a nearby hearth was, were discarded, also preserved a quantity of fish scales. Detailed botanical analyses were conducted on a few of the trash pits associated with the Spanish houses, and they generally reveal a broader range of plant foods than in some other contexts at San Luis. Along with the crops of corn, beans, and sunflowers that the Appalachians grew, European foods like wheat, garbanzo beans, or chickpeas, peaches, and figs were identified. Of the last group, most of them grew pretty well around San Luis, but garbanzo beans need a cool, dry climate to thrive, and they were likely imported as dry goods. Now, all of the homes held a lot of architectural artifacts. The daub houses contained hundreds of pounds of daub, the clay that had been plastered over the wood. Since these homes burned, the clay was fired hard, and many fragments still retain the impressions of the wood that had been inside the clay, and some retain the layers of whitewash that had sealed the clay. Hand-wrought hardware was also common, since all of the Spanish homes were fastened together with nails and spikes. Now, it's important to remember that it was the Appalachians that supplied the labor to construct these houses. They prepared the wooden posts and set them in place. They framed out the homes and dug those pits to obtain the clay for walls or floors. Taken as a whole, the most common artifacts from either the houses or their trash deposits are fragments of native-made pottery. The Spaniards had a long tradition of cooking and serving in ceramic vessels, so at San Luis, as in most Spanish colonial period sites, Indian-made ceramics are the most common cooking and serving containers. In fact, Appalachian women were probably doing much of the cooking and serving for the Spaniards, 
so it was natural for them to use their traditional pottery for those purposes. As far as we know, it was Appalachian women who were making the traditional pottery, but they also made a type of pottery that archaeologists call Kelowna ware. Kelowna ware was pottery made in the traditional hand-coiled fashion that replicated European vessel forms. It was produced in two distinct types, one decorated or painted version called Mission Red Filmed and a plain undecorated version, but both types skillfully copied European vessels. The highest numbers of Kelowna ware fragments and the broadest range of copied vessel forms are in the Spanish households. We've seen copies of brimmed plates, bowls, chamber pots, pitchers, cups, skillets, and candle holders from these contexts. One of the trash-filled clay mines associated with the house near the Northeast Plaza edge, feature 174, held an amazing assemblage of pottery, including restorable examples of every one of the colonial ware forms. Another reason we think this was perhaps the deputy governor's home. It seems that the supply of imported European tableware wasn't always adequate to keep up with the Spaniards' demands, and the Appalachian potters may have produced Kelowna ware as a commodity for sale or barter. Now, having said that, there was a fairly large amount of imported Spanish tradition pottery in the houses and their trash deposits. The tin enameled majolicas that were being produced in Mexico and brought into San Luis primarily through the port at San Marcos included types that were made toward the end of the 17th century. Fragments of olive jars, larger vessels that had uses as containers for storage or transport were also common. Most of the homes held a little Asian porcelain, either in their floors or their trash pits or both. The Spanish were involved in a trans-Pacific trade in Asian silks, porcelain, and other goods. Uh, that porcelain was probably purchased in Havana in trade for some of the agricultural surplus of Appalachian province. Most of the Spanish homes or their trash pits held artifacts that are associated with women and children. Some of the artifacts associated with Spanish women are items related to sewing, such as thimbles, needles, and straight pins. One sewing-related artifact recovered from a trash-filled clay mine was a length of silk thread, more evidence of the Spaniards' Asian trade. It was wrapped around a copper fragment, and tiny copper threads were also incorporated into the silk, and all that copper preserved the silk so well that it is still pliable. Other artifacts associated with women are particular types of jewelry, such as earrings or earring components. The most common type of artifact apparently associated with children from the Spanish residences are fragments of ceramic figurines, dolls. There are clearly two different types of the figurines. One type is a solid fired bisque figurine. The other type has solid arms and legs, but hollowware bodies and heads. The hollowware figurines are sometimes red filmed. Another artifact associated with children are very small finger rings of glass or jet. Now jet is a mineral like a very hard coal. Some of the rings are much too small to have been worn by an adult. One of the thimbles from feature 174 is also small. Little girls practiced their sewing skills, and I think this thimble is evidence of a young female in that home. The glass and lapidary bead assemblages from the Spanish village are quite large, especially from the clay mines recycled as trash pits. We screened these contexts with fine window mesh and so recovered not only the larger beads, but many very small glass beads as well. The trash pits held from over 1400 
to well over 2,000 glass or stone beads and pendants or fragments of them. One of the lapidary pendants is known as a ega pendant. It was in the shape of a clenched fist and was supposed to offer protection from the evil eye. Most of the examples from the Spanish village are of jet, but one example was cast from brass. The trash pit associated with the home on the east edge of the plaza held nine examples of the jet higa pendants. Now the most common type of artifact related to clothing from the Spanish village was buckles, and they weren't very numerous. Only a couple of 17th century buttons were identified, along with an aglet, a little rolled copper point that held the laces used to tie clothing together. Bottle fragments were pretty common, both in the houses and in their trash deposits. Most of the bottle fragments aren't large enough to get an idea of the bottle's forms, but square-sectioned olive green bottles were repeatedly recognized. Fragments of a glass tumbler or drinking glass were found next to the home on the northeastern plaza edge, and a nearly complete glass of vial was found in many fragments from its trash deposits. Another reason this seems to be the home of an important person. Artifacts associated with religion were not very common. Jet rosary beads, or fragments of them, were recognized from three of the trash-filled pits, and a brass cross fragment was recognized from one of them. A small fragment of a cast brass crucifix was recovered from inside one of the homes. One very elaborate cast brass crucifix, about five and a half centimeters high and four centimeters wide, covered with Catholic iconography, was found just outside the home on the northeast plaza edge. Very few Spanish coins have been found at San Luis. You might lose a glass bead and not worry about it, but you kept track of your coins. The Spanish village has produced a couple of the silver cob coins in common use during the 17th century. And while they're pretty worn, it appears that both were minted in Mexico City. The Spanish had a passion for gaming, and we found plenty of evidence of that in the Spanish village. Two square bone die have been recovered from the village. Much more common were little ceramic discs, probably used as game counters. Think checkers or backgammon. They're made of broken pottery and can be formed of native or European ceramics. Now, it's been said that the lifestyle of the Spaniards at San Luis might have been envied even by Spaniards who lived in St. Augustine. We should remember that that lifestyle came at a very high cost for the Appalachians. Well, thank you for taking a look at the, the Spanish village at San Luis with me.